Uh, but I have a very good friend down there I've worked with for five years. And uh, he's Catholic. That's okay. There's some good Catholic people. But he, uh, he and I talk about the Lord all the time. And, and we talk about church. And he'll say, uh, he'll ask me different questions about the church. You know, he'll say, well, what time you start? Well, I said, sometimes I have an elders meeting. I start at 6.30. I said, if it's not 6.30, it's about 8.30 to 9 o'clock. I'm going to the prayer room. I said, he goes, what time you go? I said, well, then other people come in, and there's a bunch of people in there before 10 o'clock. Church starts around 10, and it goes to about noon. He goes, noon! I said, oh, yeah, but they don't leave that. I said, they hang around till 1, 1.30. He goes, what do they do? I said, oh, they're... They're talking about what happened, about each other. They just love each other. I said, it's just fun. He goes, he goes, 7 30, 8 30, 9 30, 10 30, 11 30, 12 30. So that's half your day. I said, yeah, it's really a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, he can't even, can't even begin to imagine. Well, I don't know if you have anything to put up there or not. Okay. Going to talk about a spiritual portfolio. I always like to tell you how things happen sometimes when I, on the things I preach on. I don't sit down and know I'm supposed to preach and try to think of something. I was actually down here worshiping several weeks after Kirk asked me or told me I was going to preach. And uh, I'm worshiping, just having a good time with the Lord. And the Lord says, everyone needs a spiritual portfolio. I understood what he meant immediately. I understood what he meant as soon as he told me that. And you ask, what is a spiritual portfolio? A spiritual portfolio is a place in your mind, a pocket, where you put really important things. Times when the Lord has spoke to you, regardless how he did it. Things he's done for you. Uh, testimonies. Let me double check, make sure I get them all. Time the, times the Lord has moved in your life. And testimonies from other people you can trust. That's what you put down in this portfolio, and you have to refresh yourself with it often, often, so you can get to it whenever you need to. You think, well, why do I need to get to that? Well, there were things said today about thinking back in the past and how good it, what good it did them. That, that, I really like hearing those kind of things. History is, is very important and that's what a portfolio is doing. It's, it's holding your spiritual history. Let me read to you just a couple passages. Uh, Deuteronomy 6. You don't have to turn there. I'm gonna, I'll just read these. When I get something I really want you to see, I'll ask you to turn to it. Deuteronomy 1 through 6. Let me read this to you. Then I'm going to read 20 through 25. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord God has commanded to, to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord God to keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, and you, and your son, and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Go over to 20. When your son asks you in times to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies? the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you. Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And with a mighty hand, the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes and great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh and all his household. Then he brought us up out of there and he brought us in to give us this land in which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for all the days that he might preserve us alive as it is today. The Lord told them, you pull up out of your portfolio and you make sure you tell your sons and grandsons about this when they ask. It's important what he did. It's important to remember what he's done because that tells you what he'll do. Did you get that? Psalms 103. I just got a few scriptures I want to read to you before I actually get started. You think I got started, but I didn't yet. Psalms 103. This is really good. One, Psalms 103, 1 and 5.
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Well, how can you remember or not forget his benefits if you don't remember? You have to put it in a place to remember. Now, you'd say, oh, I'm not going to forget him. You wouldn't believe how many people over the years I've counseled with, talked to, shared stories with, that would say things like this. And these are Christians. They'll say, oh, the Lord never does anything in my life. The Lord doesn't hear me. The Lord never talks to me. The Lord's not ever going to do anything for me. I, I love hearing that stuff because I'll take those people and I'll say, well, and I'll start talking to them. And keep dig, digging and digging in their life back to the time they got saved. And pretty soon they're telling you they remember things God did, things he spoke, things out of mercy and kindness that happened to them. They had forgotten. And when you get in a desolate place, a hard place, a dry place, or a very very important strategic place it seems, and it's hard, you got to have something to draw from. And you know when you're a baby Christian, you're just starting out building that thing and you don't know what God will do. You hear these testimonies, you read the word and you think, yeah, you know. But as you build that portfolio and you continually make yourself remember all the little things God does in your life, all the things he speaks to you, all the things he maybe doesn't do and the way he does them, Oh, it is such a grand thing to pull out of that. And, and I'll tell you, we all need that. We all need that. It's a, it's a very important tool. Psalms 105, 1 through 5. I, I love this. This is what it says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. I love to do that. I love to make known his deeds. I love to give testimonies of people who got healed. I love to give testimonies about words of knowledge I've had in, out in the public. I just love to do that. It encourages people. And that's what you need to do. You need to pull up out of your spiritual portfolio the things that have happened, the deeds he's done, and tell your kids, tell your grandkids. Tell anybody to listen is what you do. Sing to him. Sing songs to him. Talk of his wondrous works. You never quit talking about his wondrous works. You have to. You got to keep telling people, especially your family. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who rejoice seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works, which he has done. Oh. I love that one. You got to remember all the little things, middle-sized things, big things, all the things he does in your life. Linda and I, we don't have a schedule to do this, but I know several times a year, more than several, we'll sit down in the evening and eat dinner and chit-chat, and either she'll say or I'll say, boy, isn't it something where we've come from? Remember what the Lord did here? I said, yeah. And we'll just start reminiscing over over what the Lord's done. And we, we did this one time. We thought we'd go back as far as we can and see all the decisions we made and all the things that happened in our life. It was all geared upon the Word of God and what the Lord had done for us. That's why we're in alliance. I mean, just incredible. It's encouraging. And when my family gets together, together, I get together, together, <laughs> Jenny and George and the kiddos, and my son Tim and his wife and her kiddos, we get together, we talk about this a lot. What the Lord has spoke to us what he's done. Isn't this great what the Lord did? It is healthy, healthy to do that. There's a, I have just met so many people that can't remember what he's done in their life and doesn't say much about it. 1 Samuel 17, 33. Let me read this to you. Yeah, 17. Here we are. This is uh, when the Philistine army was you know, defying the army of God, Israelites, and making a mockery of them. And Goliath was out there, you know, just challenging them every day. And Saul and everybody else was shaking in their boots, wouldn't go out and confront him. And David, the uh, shepherd boy, comes running in. And this is what he says. Moreover, David said, 
the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, who delivered me from the paw of the bear, I love this, <laughs> will deliver me from the hand of the fisting. Oh, I'm telling you. He, he reached down in his spiritual portfolio. And he said, let me tell this guy what the Lord's done in my life. Let me tell him where my heart is and what's going on. He had such a portfolio. Now, I don't think it was normal. Now, I didn't read any history on it, but I don't think it was normal for the shepherds back in to take and beat a bear in the face and grab him by his beard. I just don't think, I, I, I don't know about you, that cannot be the normal shepherd. Or to grab a lion and grab him by his beard and whack him. That just, was that normal? I don't think it was. But God had done miraculous things in David's life and moved in him such a wonderful way because of his heart and the confidence he had in him because he would do something so splendid and so miraculous as letting him take a bear and a lion on, this Philistine's nothing. But he pulled that up out of his portfolio. He knew that. And you know the end of that story. Cut his head off. 1 Samuel 30. I'm going to read you one more. This is when uh, David is men were at war. The Amalekites come back around in their town Ziglag. They burn it to the ground and kidnapped all their wives and children. Now, can you imagine? You're out at battle. You're tired. You're wore out. You come back home. It's time to feast and rest. Your, your town's burnt to the ground. Your children are kidnapped. And, and, and your wives are gone. Oh, I, you know, I really, I've been in some bad spots. I've never been anything like that. I don't know how disheartening that would be. But, you know, when you get in a spot like that, you got to blame somebody. And the army, the men started turning towards David, talking about stoning him. Now, David lost two, li two wives and children. He was in the same spot, but he was the leader. And look what it says that David did. One of the neatest scriptures in the Bible, I think, in the Old Testament. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. So, you know, he went to the high priest. They prayed and asked the Lord, should I chase after him? He goes, yeah, you'll catch up with him and you'll get them all. But where he says, he strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, how do you think he did that? Now, it doesn't tell you in the Bible, looked up things, and he didn't just say, oh, I strengthened myself in the Lord, strengthened myself in the Lord. Oh, I strengthened myself in the Lord. <laughs> I don't think that would do anything. I think he thought about God's character. I think he thought about all God's judgments in his life. I think he thought about all the things he had done for him, the times he had answered prayer. That's what he was strengthening himself in, in, in God. And how he had treated him, what he had done for him. I'm sure that's what he did. And so now he's getting up a little bit of, he's getting out of the hole. And he goes and, and he sees the Lord, wants to know what, what can happen. And the Lord says, chase after him, you're going to get them all back. That's exactly what happened. Now, if he had stayed in the frame of mind those men were in, instead of strengthening his heart in the Lord, this would not have been in the Bible. It wouldn't have been like this if it wasn't David. It would have been a whole different story. Could have got stoned. That's what they were going to do. Now, I'd kind of like to share a little bit of my portfolio. Because, see, I don't know anybody else as much except my wife's and a little bit here or there and my children. But I know my portfolio quite well. I'd like to share with you some of the things that are in it and how I use it. Now, you all know, you probably all know I'm going dry. <clears throat> you all know how I love seeing healings. Oh. I'm telling you, I love seeing people get healed. I've seen a lot of people get healed. I've seen small things, big things, middle-sized things. But I get a couple things out of that. I get a marvelous joy for the person being healed. I really do. I, I, I get such a marvelous joy in my heart out of this individual. It's not like this anymore, that they're healed. And the second thing I get out of that is that I don't know about anybody else ever telling a story about being around somebody getting healed, but when I'm praying for people and seeing them get healed, there's a presence of God that's different. And oh, I enjoy that so much. I prayed, I prayed, and some of you probably heard a story. I have, I, some of these things I'll probably repeat myself and I'll, I'll try to cut them short. I prayed for eight or nine months when I went to another church in East Liverpool. When I drove from Liverpool to Alliance to Cassidy's to go to work and back home, I prayed for at least eight, nine months. And I'm telling you, I prayed every day. 
I did pray every day, ask God, do you still heal people? Because the church I went to didn't believe they healed people unless you prayed for them and waited a few days and maybe they'd be okay. It was not like laying hands on them, getting healed. And I'd read that in the Bible and I got mixed up and I had nobody teach me. So I just kept asking the Lord. Now, one day I went home. It was a, it was a fall day. I, I worked a lot of hours, 10, 12 hours. So that was a 12, 14 hour day with the drive. Didn't see the kids much. Tim was about my son. Jenny, she's the older by a few years. Tim was about two and a half, going on three at that time. And I come home from work and they really ran to me. I mean, it was really nice. You know, I didn't get to see them much. And they'd run to the door and meet me. Well, I'm, I'm opening the screen door. And Timmy comes out. And, kids, how do they get their fingers where they get them? I don't know. I mean, you had kids. You know how it goes. And somehow Timmy sticks his fingers in the jam of the storm door. The wind blew. I let go of it by accident. Whew. Just like a break. Right there between his two knuckles, it's a Navaru. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I pulled him out of there, and they're snapped back, and there's a dent down in him. He is screaming like a siren. You can talk to Lynn Nasker. You couldn't even hear yourself think. I picked him up, and he's still going off like a siren. His, his lips are starting to go blue because he's running out of oxygen. And I thought to myself, 15 minutes to the emergency room. Oh, then they're going to hurt him. What am I going to do? This was not premeditated. I can't believe I even did it. It had to be Holy Spirit in me doing something. But I reached down and grabbed his little bent fingers and put them back in place. Yeah. And I yelled, Jesus, heal him. And he went from a curdling scream that was deafening. And he goes, <sighs> Keller started coming to his lips. I thought, Linda was there. She saw it. Jenny was there. Jenny may have been too little to remember. I thought, he does. <laughs> he heals people. <laughs> oh, he does. He heals people. Oh, I was beside myself. Well, that went into my portfolio. He heals people. He may not heal. He healed one. He'll heal again. But the one scripture that I got with that, I'll tell you, I, like, I love this scripture. It, is, it has formed my prayer life praying for people. It's Luke 18, 1 through 8, where... Jesus tells a parable of the woman going to the unjust judge. He's, an on, he's not a believer, and she needs advocated. And she just nags him to the point he doesn't want nagged anymore, and he, give, he avenges her. Now, God's not an unjust judge. He's trying to make a point. Don't quit praying for the same thing. Come to, now, he must want us to be persistent. And one thing he told me a long time ago, I just kind of, believe this part of it. See, when you expect something, you really expect it when you're praying. Do you know that's a fruit of faith? Let me, hear, let me tell you that again. When you're praying for something and you're really expecting it, don't hope it happens anymore. You expect it. It's a fruit of faith in your heart. And I think he wants to develop that in us. You know, I remember praying for sick people <laughs> a lot and nobody getting healed. And one time somebody came up to me and they said, don't you get tired of praying for the sick people and not seeing them? No! No, I'm not tired of doing it. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it. And I'd see another one get healed and 10 would go by, I'd see another one get healed. And eventually I started learning and picking up part of God's heart and understanding to do what Jesus did. We were at, uh, Linda and I were at, a high, these aren't all about healings, but I got a couple, so I'm going to go through those first. Linda and I were at a Ohio Valley Hospital down visiting her aunt one time. She was in there for some reason, and there was other family members there. And I sat down beside the bed. It was the only seat left. There was a curtain. It was a semi-private room. And the lady in the other bed, whoo, was she crying. Do you remember that, Lenny? She was screaming and crying. You couldn't hardly talk because of her. And... My first thought was, we can't even talk. That's really godly. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Lord takes an account and cuts us slack for our, where we are at times. I did, I thought, we can't even talk. I got thinking about it. Man, that lady's hurting. She hasn't quit since we got in here. So I quietly prayed, Jesus, if I go pray for her, me and Linda, will you heal her? And the Lord said immediately, go see what I will do. 
well, is this the time he's going to deal with my pride, my embarrassment, my humility? Is he going to teach me a lesson like that? That's hard. i got unbelieving families sitting here. None of them are believers. They already think we're wacko. <laughs> and all this is going through my head. But, but he said, go see what I will do. So I stand up, motion to Linda, and the whole family goes, <laughs> I'll tell you, that's what it looked like it did. We walk around the other side of the curtain. Oh, this lady's hurting. She had fallen off of a stepladder, only three steps high, backwards, doing something in the house. She'd been in there for two days. They could not get the pain to quit from the top of her head to her feet. They had IVs in her. She's just screaming. So while she's screaming, Linda and I talking to her, we said, hey, <laughs> I don't know what kind of faith you have, what you believe, or I said, whatever, but we believe in Jesus, and if it's okay, we pray for you to see if he'll heal you. I don't care what you do. Remember that? <laughs> oh, she did. I said, we're going to start with your head, and we're going to write down your body, lady. We laid our hands on her head, started praying, and she goes like, no, she's screaming. And she goes, And then she made more noise than she did before. She raised her arms in bed and started worshiping God. Oh, screaming to him, thanking him. While she made more noise, praising and thanking him than she was hurting, a nurse heard it in the hall, come running in with a hypodermic needle. She goes, move. She goes, mm. She goes, she'll be okay now. Right. I was so frustrated. <laughs> but I thought, the Lord healed her head and neck. All that pain was, she told us. That's why she was worshiping God. So Linda and I, while she's knocked out, we just went right down her body, prayed, <laughs> yes, prayed for that, prayed for that, prayed for that, visited and went home. I never seen her in the rest of my life. I imagine she was totally healed when she woke up. I mean, why wouldn't she be? The Lord was already doing that. Well, that, that, pride and humility and embarrassment, I had to tuck that away. I had to remember that because I had a fight and that was hard to fight in front of her family. It really was because I didn't know what God was going to do. But I tucked that in there. I thought, boy, I got to remember this one. And that wasn't too many years later. I was at work at the steel mill and I was working with an atheist named Ed. Everybody knew he was an atheist. Everybody knew I was a preacher. We worked side by side for about a year. And uh, he got to tell me about his girlfriend, Fran. Maybe some of you, if you're, you may even remember this. Uh, at that time, it was a year before. This is probably 25 years ago. There was a woman pulling off of Mahoning Avenue onto State Street. Early morning hours it was foggy. And a semi-truck hit her car, drove her motor into her lap, and put her in the back seat. It rushed her to the hospital. She, she was in intensive care for weeks. Uh, she had lost a total of eight, nine pints of blood, but they saved her. They were able to fix everything but her feet. They said the bones in her feet were so tiny, they were all busted up, couldn't do anything about it. And uh, Ed's telling me about her. I don't even know her. Her name was Fran. Well, I started getting a burden for her. And so I asked the Lord for a week. Now, I'm not going to go pray for an unsaved person in this shape and defraud them. I don't even know them. So I asked the Lord, hey, if I pray for this woman, will you heal her? Will you heal her? One week, one week almost exactly, I'm walking into my job, into my job area, and the Lord goes, hey, go see what I'll do. <laughs> well, that's good. That isn't what I wanted to hear. I heard that before. He makes me wonder what he's going to do. <laughs> it's awful. But I was a little more excited about it because I had one to go on. I remember that. Okay, I remember. That was really good. Okay, so now i got to face this embarrassment and humility, pride. i got to go to this atheist and ask him if I can come and pray for his girlfriend who I don't even know. So I did. And he goes, okay, I'll ask her. He came back the next day, and she said, yes, she'd like that. And just so for your information, and I store this way because things happen, and you don't understand. That was on a Monday. He came back Tuesday, he told me we'd do it Friday. I said, okay, on Wednesday, the Lord told me, I don't want Ed there. I don't want the boyfriend there. 
I told Jesus, I said, Jesus. <laughs> I'll put you in my spot. What are you going to do? Hey, you can't come. I'm going to pray for your girlfriend. The Lord told me you're to stay home. <laughs> then he probably canceled the whole thing. So I, I just did what I did. I told the Lord, I said, I, I don't know what to do about that. So I don't know if he was, he was showing me his sovereignty. He was teaching me. But I remember the situation, and I've applied it before or since. But what happened on the day I was supposed to go pray for her, he come to me and said, Brand doesn't want me there. I'm going to take a long shower. I'll come home after you're done. What? It, so I, I learned about listening and filling out a situation. And uh, Linda couldn't go. We got company at home. So I actually come and ask, where's Rachel? Rachel went here. She's Rachel Martin. She was in high school. So I come in. I thought, boy, they believe in that. I got to get somebody to go with me. I can't go to this woman's home by myself. So I ran over to the school before it closed and asked Rachel and another person to go. To this day, I can't remember who that person is. So we went, knocked on the door. The lady was very pretty, long blonde hair. She had a dress on, a cross, her hose, her makeup. She was expected a preacher. I'm in jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> she was so disappointed. I saw it all over her. Talk about humiliation and pride. Now I got to wade through that to keep my heart right to pray for her. Come on, she goes, come on in. And, and she, she, I mean, oh, she walked horrible. And what was what was big deal? Her boyfriend and her were avid golfers. He wanted to be uh, semi-pro, golfed all the time. She can't even walk around the house now hardly. So we sat down, preached the gospel to her, asked Rachel. I didn't even pray for her. I never touched a woman. I didn't even pray. I just stood there and watched. So Rachel and the other young girl prayed for her. Her toes were curled up and stiff. They couldn't move. She had lumps on them. As Rachel prayed, this lump sinks right down in. Rachel looks at me. I said, shh. We want her to say something. She looked up. She goes, did you see that? I said, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. She goes, I feel hot. I said, let's pray again. <laughs> we prayed again. They prayed again. Her toes let down. I said, hey, wiggle your toes. And she goes, oh, yes, yeah. you wiggled all ten of them. I said, why don't you get up and walk? She walks like a model. Now, she was supposed to be crippled for life. She'd been crippled nine months. Can you imagine the joy in her? Oh, I was so ecstatic for her. I was screaming. I mean, I was just so happy for her. She walked out and come back and sit down, put her hands on her face. She goes, oh, my God, Jesus, you're real, you're real, you're real. Here, her mother was a Christian sharing the gospel with her. Yeah. Just had her boyfriend come in. Macho dude. This dude's macho, baby. Macho. Walks in the side door. Oh, I wish I had this on tape. She stood up and goes, look at me. And she twirled, no kidding, she twirled around like a little girl like this going around him. Jesus healed me, Jesus healed me. He's going, <laughs> never said a word. And then in the middle of that, the Lord spoke to me. He said, get out of there now. I mean, he, he said it like that too. Get out of there now. Well, I wanted to stay. <laughs> I didn't want to leave. I want to stay and see this. Get out of there now. I grabbed, I told the girl, I said, well, we got to get out of here. Went right out while she's twirling around him. I worked with him for months, months after that. Never said a word. One day I couldn't take it no more. He had house friend. Oh, just the way you left her. I said, don't you ever think about that? Oh, no, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> then I found out she left him and gave her life to the Lord. Now, All the years of other things happening, dealing with my pride, my humility, my embarrassment, knowing when the Lord says something, you got to do what he tells you. That's what caused me to go. Now, do you know all the vain imaginations I have before that happens? How embarrassing I feel if I go pray for this unsaved person and I work with all these people and her husband and her boyfriend lives with her nose and I go out there, I waste her time, his time, I can fool myself and the, and the whole Christian community and he goes back and tells them, I think of that stuff. I think of that every time. So I got to know I'm hearing from God. I, I, I got to listen to him. You got to do what he says. And you just got to keep your head right with the Lord. And I keep putting that down in there. This works. This works. I just got a little bit more. You know, we're 
I like this. The Lord, when I was putting this together, the Lord was speaking to me. He said, you know, you're a lot like David. You know, you're all, all a lot like David, like me. He was a king or not. <laughs> he was a great warrior or not. He saw the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> we never did. But you know what the biggest thing we have in common with David we approach the same God. We approach the same God. And I like that scripture in James. I put that down in there. I remember it all the time. He's not a respecter of persons. Well, if I can keep my heart right, even though I backslide, I get right again. Even though I fall down, I get back up again. Even though I'm not going right, then I do right again. And, and by, I'm a righteous man because of the blood of Christ. And I'm just like David. And if I just stay like that in my heart, he'll move in my life just like he did David. Oh, that's down in there. I think about that in my spiritual portfolio all the time. Do you see how important it is to remember different scriptures that affect your life in times the Lord speaks to you and things that happen? It is so important because, see, you don't know what's coming up and you use that. I'm just sorting through this. I, you know that Psalms I was reading in 105, 5, where it says... Uh, Remember his wondrous works and tell him about him all the time. Well, you probably, some of you have heard the story about me falling asleep on my motorcycle. When we lived in East Liverpool, uh, I drove up here for eight years to work, and I drove two years on my motorcycle all winter. Never missed a day's work. I wouldn't do that now, but never missed a day's work. And uh, I was on night turn, one night going home. I worked 4 to 12, got my shower. It had been cold all that week. I was really heavily dressed for riding in the winter. But it had gotten up to like 35. That's warm. And I got really sleepy driving home. I got too warm. <laughs> and after you go past Kent, Kent State University on Route 45, going out of Salem, you get down around these bends, there's a straight stretch. And I knew a, a, a cop would sit down there every night. Well, that was a 55 zone. I checked my speedometer, and I dozed off looking down at my speedometer. By the time I woke up, I must have shot the whole stretch, that straight stretch. And I thought, oh, this is not good. I look up, and I'm already failed to negotiate the turn. I went into the ditch. Ditch about like that. Oh, it hurt so bad, banging me in the seat, and I couldn't see. And instinctively, instinctively, because of my past life, all the things I'm always talking about, always sharing with people, always giving testimony to, instinctively, I know in my portfolio, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. I don't know how many times I screamed that in that ditch. And I'm watching. I mean, you can't see nothing. You know, the light's going like this. And I'm just screaming, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. And all of a sudden, in a flash of an eye, I was up on the highway doing 15 miles an hour screaming, oh, Jesus, help me. I got translated out of the ditch. All I'm telling you, you can't drive out of that ditch. I didn't have a motocross. Even a motocross, I couldn't have got out of it. Ah, I pull up in this guy's driveway and lay down in the snow, and I think about this. I'm thinking, uh, nobody's going to buy this. <laughs> nobody will ever believe this one. Oh. I continually, continually remind myself of those marvelous works and the good things God's done in my life. I won't forget them. There may be a day come when he requires me to be martyred. And at that time, I will even remember his goodness in my life and how he could save my life, but he chose not to. And it'll bring quite a peace to me. I think about this. I don't forget about these things. And you, you've got to continually, re even if they're smaller things, little things, they're important things that God's done in your life. Oh, I'm winding down. I just got to get unconfused here. Uh, <laughs> oh, I want to share this, this verse, man. Psalms 34, 15. Oh, this is, this is so sweet. Listen to this. Psalms 34, 14, and 17, and 18. And these, I mean, I passionately just love these verses. And they come alive to me after that happened. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their cry. <laughs> <laughs> can you, oh, I, I think there's nights I'm going to bed. I can't. I think about that. He heard me. He heard me within split seconds of screaming out to his name. He heard me. 
and he delivered me. I mean, and then 17, 18, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears. You can't ever think he doesn't hear you. He may not speak all the time. He may not move all the time. But I want to tell you, when you're in a dilemma and your back's against the wall, and you're screaming out to him, he's going to do something or say something. And oh, that's so, that's so good to carry that and to know that. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and as such have a contrite spirit. See, we can be imperfected, not like Jesus yet, and have things he's dealing with us over. But if we'll just have a broken heart before him and a contrite heart, and if we'll just continually decide we're giving our life to him, oh, those are the people that he moves in their behalf. He really does. It's not the, it's not the, even David, look at David's life. Look what he did. And look how God moved mightily because he kept a broken spirit and a broken contrite heart. I'm going to tell you one more. We lived in Sebring a while. This is really good, man. We, I use this a lot. We lived in Sebring, moved down there, and uh, moved beside a couple, a little bit older than us. They had teenage kids. His name was Larry. Nice people. Got to know them. They had just gotten saved. And a month or two after we were down there, his teenage daughter ran away with a teenage girl. I think she may have been a cousin, part of the rest of the family. He calls me up one night and tells me what happened. They're heartbroken. Well, all the family's over at his house, and they're in different rooms because they're blaming each other's daughter. They're all Christians. And he wants me to come over and pray. I'm thinking, jeez, yeah, right. What do I pray? So I go over to the house. First thing I know, I got to get these people together. So I get them all in the same room, and I, we hold hands. And I really don't know what I'm going to ask the Lord. I was going to ask the Lord, I think, to deal with their hearts. And all I said was, Lord... <laughs> and the Spirit of God spoke to me, like was standing beside me. And this is what he said. You ask for something you think I can't do. Man, I paused. Whew, ask for something I don't think you can do. See, nobody would ever contradict that scripture where it says all things are possible with God. If you were, if I come up and read that to you, I said, do you believe that? Everybody would say yes. Yes. But when you start nitpicking the hard things in your life, your life and your prayer life tell the truth whether you believe that. Do you understand me? Your prayer life and your life tells whether you really believe that. And I, I, there was things I wouldn't ask God to do in front of them. People, my reputation, number one was a Christian, praying ain't going to happen. I don't believe it. And I don't know what, I'm not going to ask God to do something I don't think he won't do. And I don't want to defraud these people. I mean, there was so much going through my head when he spoke. And when he said, ask for something you think I can't do, I understood what he meant. He was challenging me to trust him. I said, okay. I said, Lord, have these girls back in this house by midnight tonight safe. I thought I'd have never prayed that in a minute. Prayed a little bit and told those people to get along with each other, chit chat a little bit, I want you to pray for the kids. And I went home and told Larry, I said, hey, I got to get up early. I'm going to bed. I said, if something happens, you call me. Quarter to 12, he calls. <laughs> the police had the kids in the car. They were almost home. <laughs> oh, did I learn one on that one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, because the Spirit of God spoke to me and challenged me. Those girls are back home by midnight. Now, not because I did it, because I listened to him and he did what he, he, did what he said he was going to do. And, oh, I, I keep that. Well, a few years later, we had a, a tragedy in our family, um, other members of our family. I didn't get permission to talk about it. I forgot, so I can't talk about it without their permission, but it was a tragedy. And 8.30 one morning, uh, I was on vacation, sitting on the back deck eating breakfast, and I find out about this tragedy. Linda's sitting there. And I just shook my head. I thought, man, we're in deep over this one. And she remembered that story when we lived back in Sebring. And she put that in her portfolio. And she said, I'm pulling one out of yours. That's what she said. She says, I remember what God told you. We're using that right now. He said to ask for something you don't think I'll do. And boy, she started praying. Within two hours, we saw it. 
telling you. I, I wish I could tell you the story. We saw it. Oh, I, I thought, man, she remembered that. Man, the Lord did that. So that's two now with that. I mean, it's good. It's good to remember what the Lord will do. Yeah, I, I got I, I got a short and then I'm gonna quit. I uh oh I oh I could I got some money and things I wish I could tell you. I was in a bad car wreck when I lived in East Liverpool driving from Alliance. Bad car wreck. There was three of us driving. Uh, Kenny Jones, good friend of mine, I was riding with him. He had a, an old Chevy station wagon with a V8 in it. and It was wintertime. It was cold. So Linda gave me an Afghan that day to throw over me in the car. And on the way home, about 3.30 in the afternoon, I'm covered up. and We're going down a ski slope, right? If you pass uh, on 45, that big ski slope. We're going down that. And I'm dozing in and out. And I hear his four barrel kick in. Don't read much to me. He's passing somebody, I guess. And all of a sudden, I hear squealing tires. Oh. I open my eyes, and I didn't have them open. I don't know what a fraction of a second is, but it was, wasn't even a fraction of a second. And what I see right in front of me as I open my eyes, so we're going 60 plus because he kicked a four barrel in. There's this big sign explosives. Flammable. <laughs> oh, that's what I got to see. Oh, bam. We hit the broad side of an LP gas truck loaded with bottles. He made a left turn in front of him when he passed him. No turn signal. Boom, bam. LP gas bottles all over the ground, hissing on the car, hissing. They had to, they had to cut me out of the car. It looked like the, the man was driving, thought I was dead, telling the guy in the back I was dead. I was bleeding so profusely. And it was bleeding. I think I, I probably would have bled. I asked the Lord, I said, stop that bleeding, please. And it stopped right now. It was a testimony of that unsaved man. Got to the hospital. And the sheriff tells us he'd never seen a fatality that bad without a death. And my face looked bad because of the stitches. Looked like I needed plastic surgery. But you can see it looks really pretty today. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> what happened? See, back then, that was over 35 years ago. Back then, when you settled up with the insurance company, you got pain and suffering. Not like today. You really got pain and suffering. It was pretty easy to get it. Well, that's what guys were doing. And we talked to this insurance adjuster. He called me. He says, I'm going to be in Calcutta one day, one day a week. I'm only in Calcutta. You bring all your paperwork. You tell me how much you want. I'll write you a check. It's got to be fast, son. He says, I'm always filled up. I said, okay. I thought about that, and we didn't have a lot of money. We needed money. But I thought, I got this other scripture, see, down in my portfolio I keep. In Matthew 5, is it? Or 6, where it says, seek ye the treasures that are in heaven that you can store up in heaven, not the ones on earth. Oh, that kept plaguing me. That just kept plaguing me. So I thought, I told the Lord I'd make a deal with him. I don't make too many deals with the Lord. But I told him to make him a deal. I said, I'll make you a deal. You don't have any cars in the parking lot. <laughs> and this guy says, he's only there one day a week. And the place is filled up. I said, don't have any cars in the parking lot. Nobody in there. I said, I'll forsake all my extra money. I'll just get my glasses and coat and my missed day's work. And I'll witness to him for a half hour to an hour. I was so excited to go that day. I mean, I was beside myself thinking, what's he going to do? I put, There's not a car in the parking lot. Oh, I'm thinking, oh, oh, I felt like a kid at Christmas. I walk in, there's nobody there. He told me that was phenomenal. I got to witness to him for almost an hour. He started crying. He got shook up, talked about his life. Somebody almost killed him once. He didn't get saved, but I was able to sow seed maybe that nobody else ever did. And it was because of this scripture in my heart. I mean, I could use money like anybody else. And my face at that time, when he looked at it, I probably could have got the money because I was, <laughs> oh, there, 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 there. They couldn't get the stuff to stay in my nose to sew it up. It'd go down my throat. It was all cut up. But, and he was real quick to write me a check. Well, he wrote that check. I said, now I want to talk to you until somebody comes in. He goes, go ahead. We talked a long time about his soul. So I'm done. I just want to finish with one thing. I keep that. I remember that. I forsook something I could have in this world. And the Lord did trade it in for me. I mean, that's amazing that he traded that in for me and let me have that because I desired treasures in heaven. It's not that I was trying to put up something I can say I did up there, but those are treasures in heaven. 
It's where your heart is. And I keep that with me. And I use that. And I look back over my life. It's like God's a weaver. And he's got this big needle and this thread. And he's just going in and out of these holes. Weaving this beautiful. When I look back. Now, I'm not a smart guy. I barely got out of high school. I'm a welder at a still mill I was. I mean, I didn't have no fabulous job. I didn't work at a good place like Ted, but it has to be an intelligent individual. I worked at the still mill. <laughs> and I look back over my life because of listening to him, the things he's told me. It's, I just see this beautiful tapestry in my life. And, I, and probably there are so many beautiful tapestries sitting here, but you got to start. Now, what about you? you got to start, a, if you don't have a spiritual portfolio, and I, love, I know a lot of people don't. They forget what God does. They don't talk about it much. You need to start one. And the way you start it is by writing it down to begin with. Once every year or two, I sit down and I write every healing I've ever witnessed on paper. I do. I write down everything the Lord has ever told me, not prophecies, I don't remember, but personally spoke to me. I write them down. Everything I've ever seen him do other than a healing, and it was a miracle in my life, I write it down. Every major decision Linda and I ever made because we prayed about it, he told us what to do, I write it down. I do that about once every two years because I don't want to forget them. So I tell you, if you don't have a spiritual portfolio, you need to start doing it by writing something down. You say, well, I don't know how much. Hey, if you're a Christian, you got saved. And the Spirit of God must have moved in your life. That's a big deal. Write that down. And start thinking, how many good things happened to me? How many things turned out well? How many answers to prayer did I have? Not how many answers to prayer you didn't have. How many did you have? How, how many other Christians showed you kindness through the Lord? You need to write that down. And I'll tell you, it becomes a very valuable tool. And as you keep talking and sharing that, people want to hear that stuff. And it'll encourage people so much. So, would y'all stand? Kirk, you want to finish? Or is it okay? Yeah, would you?